The deponent averred that the petitioners had on the 10th of August 2017 written a letter to the first respondent claiming to have in their possession presidential election results which differed from the results being shown on the IEBC portal at the time. And just before issuing this letter, the petitioners had made widely publicized claims that the results transmission system had been corrupted through hacking. The deponent averred that the Constitution imposes no duty on the first respondent to use electronic systems of resource transmission exclusively. The only mandate of the first respondent being to ensure that the electoral system is simple, accurate, verifiable, accountable, and transparent. She averred that Section 44A of the Elections Act entrusts to the first respondent a statutory discretion to apply a complementary mechanism where technology fails or cannot meet the constitutional threshold of a free and fair election. The deponent averred that upon the conclusion of voting, the counting exercise had begun in the presence of all agents present, observers, police officers, and all authorized persons. She deponed that according to ELOG, an observer group which deployed one of the largest observer delegates, the petitioners had a good representation of agents. She believed that even where such agents failed to sign the prescribed forms, such failure would not invalidate the vote count results in the light of the terms of Regulation 62, Sub-Regulation 3, and Regulation 79, Sub-Regulation 6 of the Elections General Regulations 2012. She deponed that once the counting process at the polling station was concluded, the results were simultaneously dispatched electronically to the constituency tallying center and the national tallying center. And these were the results which then streamed onto the public portal at the Bomas of Kenya. The deponent averred that since the first respondent did not own telecommunication network facilities, it relied on licensed service providers. Such service providers were under obligation under Regulation 20 of the Elections Technology Regulations 2017 to provide and deliver services as may be requested by the first respondent. The first respondent, in consultation with the service providers, was required under Regulation 21 of the said regulations to identify and communicate in a timely manner to all stakeholders about the network service available at different polling stations and in areas where there was no communication network. Thus, the deponent averred Parliament introduced Section 44A to provide a complementary mechanism for the identification of voters and the transmission of results. The deponent averred that after the Court of Appeal decision in the Maina Kiai case, it had been confirmed that Regulation 83 would be the complementary system applicable in respect of the transmission of election results in the event of failure of the technological mechanism. The complementary mechanism would take the form of the physical delivery of Form 34A from the polling stations to the returning officers at the constituency telling center, while constituency returning officers would deliver Forms 34B to the national telling center in Nairobi. The deponent made averments regarding the claim of irregularity in the elections appearing in Dr. Nyangasi Oduo's affidavit. She averred that in the overwhelming majority of cases cited by Dr. Oduo, the, statute, the statement had not revealed the features typified as irregular. She deponed 
that neither the Elections Act nor the Election General Regulations requires that Form 34A <coughs> should bear the first respondent stamp. And the failure of an agent to sign the forms at the counting hall did not invalidate the results. In response to allegations of discrepancies in forms 34A and 34B, the deponent averred that no significant variations existed. She produced a report, Exhibit WG13, which showed that after reconciling the discrepancies in the forms attached to Dr. Ngasi <coughs> Oduo's affidavit, the effect was that the petitioner's vote tally improved by 595, while that of the third respondent decreased by 1,199 votes. The deponent, re, uh, res, the deponent uh, responded to the deposition from the petitioner side that the final tally of presidential election votes had not included the results for Nyando constituency, where the first petitioner had obtained 60,000 715 votes, while the third respondent obtained 214 votes. She deponed that such an oversight was not fatal, as by Regulation 87 of the Election General Regulations, the second respondent has authority to declare the presidential election results where, in the opinion of the Commission, results not yet received would not make a difference in the final results. Responding to the claim by the petitioners that there had been a suspicious disparity between the presidential vote totals and the totals for the other elective offices in the same constituencies, the deponent exhibited an analysis of results from 94 constituencies, showing that the votes cast in one or more of the five other sets of elections were more than the votes cast at those levels for the presidential candidates. The deponent denied the allegation made in affidavit sworn for the petitioners that the voting results streamed by the commission had shown a constant 11% margin between the vote count for the first petitioner and for the third respondent. In line with other depositions for the respondents, she stated that such a gap in vote count percentages had kept shifting constantly. The deponent responded to the averment from the petitioner side that the third respondent's electoral strength had benefited from running governmental actions which showed him in positive light and thus constituted censurable and due influence. She averred that there was no recruitment, there was no requirement in law that ongoing government programs be suspended during the election period, and that as Article 35 of the Constitution safeguards the right to information, the required openness made a case for current government projects and activities to be held accessible to all. In further support of the respondent stand, is the affidavit by Davis Chirchir, sworn on the 24th of August 2017. He averts that the collection of election results in Form C and the announcement thereof was done after all Forms 33B, save as regards Nyando constituency, had been electronically transmitted to the National Telling Center. He deponed in line with the depositions of Ms. Gushu, that the voting results for Nyando constituency, which had not been collected at the time of results uh, declaration, had no effect on the outcome. The deponent averred that quite contrary to the reprobation of the vote result transmission measures taken by the commission, the actions taken had been based on the authority of the law. This transmission question had already featured in a high court decision where it was held that the first respondent had duly put in place a complementary mechanism 
in terms of Section 44A of the Elections Act 2011, and that it had, with public participation, established regulations to operationalize the said statutory provision. In this context, the deponent averred that any failure of the technological devices would not impair the electoral process or become the basis for invalidity of the electoral process. The deponent averred that the petitioners claim that the security of the integrated ele electoral man management mechanism had been compromised, was not substantiated with any transcripts or video clips or any other material reference. The deponent averred that the first respondent had kept in full control of his electronic transmission system at all times and that no evidence showed it to have ceded its management or authority in that regard to any third party. He deponed that it was not true as alleged that the transmission of results from 11,000 polling stations had been compromised, especially as none of the petitioners had contested the contents of Forms 34A from the relevant polling stations. He further averred that it would not be true, as alleged by the petitioners, that a total of 11,000 polling stations would represent as much as 7,700,000 voters, given that the number of registered voters per polling station varied from one to a maximum of 700. The deponent deposed that it was not a factual statement coming from the petitioners, that the IABC had the election results streamed on the website represent a constant percentage of 54% and 44%, respectively, for the third respondent and the first petitioner. Instead, the variation between the two had oscillated between 27.06% and 9.22% in favor of the third respondent. The dependence perception on the electoral process as a whole was that the third respondent had been duly elected in a free, fair, credible, and valid election conducted on the 8th of August, 2017. Now, does the petitioner's case rest on fact? Have they discharged the burden of proof? Did the respondents discharge the evidential burden? Who is favored by the state of the evidence? The objective merits of this case must be drawn from the foundation of fact. I will subsequently revert to the vitality of fact in the configuration of jurisprudence. The juristic and scholastic preoccupation with the essence of the law and its defini defining role in social, economic, political, religious, or other crucial human engagements. Fact is thus defined, quote, something that actually exists, an aspect of reality, end of quote. Fact. Therefore, is as reliable as the concrete foundations of a, a skyscraper. And it is to be counted upon as a basis of objectivity and truth. The practice of law, and more particularly, the motions of the judicial process via the minds and hands of judges, society's trustees for justice, are invariably lodged upon the pillars of fact. This being proffered through evidence. The merits of the petitioner's case stand to be tested in the first place through evidence. 
What evidence did the petitioners adduce? And did they discharge their initial burden of proof and complete it with an effective clearance of the constant legal burden resting upon them? The evidence scenario speaks for itself, as may be summarized here. One, the petitioners resort to broad assertions of alleged wrongs on the part of the first and third respondents. Two, such alleged failings are lined up against the Constitution's prescriptions of certain values, principles, and norms. Three, the petitioner statements are often plaintive and inviting the court to ascertain their true scope in terms of legality and propriety in the measures taken by the respondents. Four, what the petitioners present as fact relates primarily to the electronic transmission of election results rather than the physical conduct of voting and enumeration of ballot. Five, and what the petitioners present as fact in relation to polling day and to the count of votes has been responded to in substantial detail in the consistent evidence emanating from the respondents. Six, the deponents on the respondent side have responded to the statements from the petitioner side. They have given testimony describing their actions in the conduct of the general election of the 8th of August 2017 as regards the tally and count of votes and the recording, transmission, and declaration of results. The respondents have in the process explained <coughs> the actions they took just before, in the course of, and in the aftermath of voting day, explaining such impediments as affected the electoral process, and invoking specific <coughs> provisions of the Constitution and the law by virtue of which they acted. Does one behold a clear evidence scenario such as ought to lead a duly perceptive court in some particular direction, of course, barring some weightier consideration of justice which compels a different course? From the evidence, the petitioners do not seek an ascertainment of the true number of votes cast for the first petitioner and for the third respondent. Even though these, as required by law, had been delivered to the Supreme Court and are kept in the custody of the registry. The petitioners have focused the burden of their case on apprehensions as to the perfect security of the transmission system, whereby the election results had earlier been relayed before the physical records were received, organized, and kept by the first respondent. They have claimed an improper tallying of votes from different polling stations, though this has been denied on the basis of specific evidence and exhibits showing the contrary. They have spoken of improper conduct during election on the part of certain government officials said to have unduly benefited the third respondent's electoral platform. But these claims have been denied by witnesses for the respondents. The veracity of such environments have been brought to question by the detailed testimony of the respondents' witnesses, Dr. Kibicho and Mr. Wakahio. The attributions to the third respondent of improper influence, intimidation, and corruption, therefore, are not just unsubstantiated, but also fail 
to meet the high standards of proof required for criminal charges. The petitioners assert in broad terms that the first respondent in the conduct of elections did, did not abide by the terms of Article 86 of the Constitution, which requires elections to be conducted in a manner that is simple, accurate, verifiable, secure, accountable, and transparent. Yet the use of the manual ballot paper would clearly meet such conditions. The voter has no difficulty in marking it. Its reality and visibility is not in doubt. It is verifiable as a check so that it reveals the voter's exercise of his or her right of choice. It is secure, it is transparent, it is accountable. The votes cast had been announced at the polling stations where they were tabulated and results announced. From that initial ascertainment of the voting situation, the results were collected at the constituency telling center and announced at that level. The first respondent thereafter provided Form 34A from all polling stations, Form 34B from constituency telling centers, and Form 34C at the National Telling Center, which was signed by all the presidential election agents, save for the petitioner's agent. Thus, from the evidence in this court record, the claim of non-compliance with the terms of Article 86 of the Constitution does not stand up. More substantial and more persuasive evidence, in my perception, has emanated from the respondent side. Several examples of such evidence may be set out here. One, Mr. Chebukati, who had been the returning officer for the presidential election, gave testimony that the verifiable physical count of the votes cast showed that the third respondent had garnered 8,203,290 votes as against the first respondent who received 6,762,224 votes. And these results were duly recorded in Form 34C, which was itself abstracted from Forms 34B forwarded to the National Tallying Center from the constituency tallying centers as well as the diaspora vote tallies. Two, Mr. Chebukati deponed that the primary resource declaration forms, Forms 34A and 34B, had in no way been compromised as and we in no way been compromised as regards their accuracy and overall integrity. He deposed that the Form 34B had been duly forwarded from the constituencies to the National Tallying Center for verification with Forms 34A and for tallying. Three, Mr. Chebukati deponed that the Commission had taken all the necessary steps to ensure that the general election in all its components complied with the constitutional requirements of simplicity, accuracy, verifiability, security, transparency, and accountability. Four, Mr. Chebukati's affirmance are specific matter of fact and in line with vital evidence emanating from other deponents on the respondent side. For instance, Mr. Chiloba, the first respondent's chief executive officer, confirms that the telling and transmission of results took place at the polling stations, after which the vote count was collected and declared at the constituency telling center and the national telling center. Mr. Chiloba gave a clear account or the transmission system used by the first respondent, as well as the context and modalities 
of the recently introduced Kenya Integrated Electoral Management System, KIMS. Four, Mr. Muhati, in his affidavit, gave still more details on the working of the electronic transmission system, an account that was entirely consistent with the environments of both Mr. Chebukati and Mr. Chilova. Six, five rather, no, it's, it's um, six. Six, specific and credible evidence in relation to the factual situation attending the conduct of the general election of the 8th of August 2017 is recorded by other deponents, such as Ms. Immaculate Kasait, the third respondent, Mr. Uh, Wakahu, Ms. Gushu, Mr. Chirchir, Dr. Kibicho, Ms. Omwenga, and Ms. Kigen Solovitz. Judges entertaining the competing claims of parties constantly have to form an opinion and from objective criteria and conviction eliminate the credible from the incredible, the truth from the untruth. That has to be done in this instance. The factual accounts of the respondents are firm and gripping. They are credible and represent the substantial truth. However, no account of equal strength is beckoning from the other side. I cannot but conclude that on the facts conveyed through evidence in support of the petitioner's case, they are on weak grounds as compared to their respondents. In establishing the merits of their case, the petitioners had both the ultimate legal burden of proof and the shifting evidential burdens falling upon them. They did not, in my appraisal, discharge even the early evidential burden, the effect being, in the end, that they made no valid case against the respondents. The law of burden of proof at the beginning and in the course of trial has been the subject of scholarship, and I cite Dr. H. F. Morris. Quote, the distinction is commonly made by commentators on the law of evidence between the use of the term in the sense of the burden which lies throughout the trial of establishing a case usually called the general burden of proof, and in the sense of the onus of producing evidence at any particular stage during the trial. There is a general burden of proof which lies throughout the trial upon one of the parties and never shifts to the other to establish the case. In a civil case, this burden lies upon the party who would lose if no evidence at all were to be produced. That is to say, in order to win, he must establish his case by a preponderance of evidence, and coupled with the onus of discharging this burden is his right to begin." End of quote. Such a position is reflected in Kenya's Evidence Act, Chapter 80, Laws of Kenya, Section 107, quote, Whoever desires any court to give judgment as to any legal right or liability dependent on the existence of facts which he asserts must prove that those facts exist, end of quote. Now, leaving the issue of evidence, now we have to consider whether perhaps the petitioners have any other case based elsewhere than upon evidence. How is the court to be guided in relation to the petitioner's claims that, quote, the presidential election was so badly conducted, administered, and managed that it failed to comply with the governing principles established under Articles 1, 2, 4, 10, 38, 81, 82, 88, 6, 88, 138, 141, 63, and 249 of the Constitution, the, election, the Elections Act, and the regulations made thereunder 
including the election, electoral code of conduct, end of quote, and in relation to the assertion that, quote, the massive, systematic, systemic, <coughs> and deliberate non-compliance with the Constitution and the law, end of quote, quote, goes to the very core and heart of holding elections as the key to the expression of the sovereign will and power of the Kenyan people, end of quote, quote, undermines the foundation of the Kenyan system as a sovereign republic where people are sovereign under Article 4 of the Constitution, end of quote, quote, and several and severely undermines the very rubric, literal, and framework of, Kenya's, of Kenya as a nation state, end of quote, question mark. How is the court to be guided in respect of the petitioner's claims that the pet, quote, the, petish, the presidential election contravened the principles of a free and fair election under Article 81E of the Constitution as read with Section 39 of the Elections Act, end of quote, that, quote, the entire process of, of relay and transmission of results from polling station to the constituency and national telling center and from the constituency telling centers to the NTC was not simple, accurate, verifiable, secure, accountable, transparent, open and prompt, substantially compromised and offended the requirement of free and fair elections under Article 81, E, 4 and 5 of the Constitution, end of quote, quote, the data and information recorded in Forms 34A and the individual polling stations were not accurately and transparently entered into the schemes at the individual polling station, end of quote, quote, the presidential election was not administered by the first respondent in an impartial, neutral, and accountable manner as required under Article 81E5 of the Constitution, end of quote, that quote, the first respondent abetted and allowed the electronic media and news channels to relay and continue relaying the purported results which the first respondent was aware had no legal basis or factual basis, end of quote, as well as other claims similarly couched. That's the question. How is the court to be guided? Such claims invoke the question as to the first respondent's compliance with the law in every detail, though without necessarily adverting to the objective facts as borne by the evidence. The court has to consider whether such contentions should be a basis for annulling the outcome of the presidential election of the 8th of August 2017. This takes us to the line of jurisprudence now established in electoral matters. The Constitution of Kenya 2010, which represents the people's much labored initiatives to find a pacific, rational, and humane regulatory structure for governance bears certain principles and it safeguards certain rights and values in unambiguous <coughs> terms. It safeguards, quote, the rule of law, democracy and participation of the people, end of quote, Article 10 to A. It safeguards political rights in detailed terms which include the provision, Article 38, 3b and c, that every adult citizen, quote, has the right without unreasonable restrictions to vote by secret ballot in any election and to be a candidate for public office and if elected, to hold office, end of quote. Such sacrosanct safeguards have to be so interpreted as to accord them true operational meaning. The same Constitution entrusts the interpretive mandate to the courts, to which, for the faithful discharge of the task, the voters have entrusted their adjudicative sovereignty. Constitution, Article 13C. How are the courts to interpret such rights and safeguards? The answer is provided in the Constitution itself, Article 20, sub Article 3. Quote, in applying a provision of the Bill of Rights 
a court shall adopt the interpretation that most favors the enforcement of a right or fundamental freedom, end of quote. And if it is the Supreme Court that is undertaking such interpretation, then just like the other courts, it is under obligation, Article 24A, to promote, quote, the values that underlie an open and democratic society based on human dignity, equality, equity, and freedom, end of quote. The Supreme Court, just like the other courts, in the course of performing its safeguarded interpretive mandate, is under obligation, certainly in the straightforward case, to be guided by the principle that, quote, justice shall be administered without undue regard to procedural technicalities, end of quote. Article 159, 2D, and the principle that, quote, the purpose and principles of this Constitution shall be protected and promoted, end of quote, Article 153, 2E. The Constitution enjoins all courts in the exercise of their interpretive mandate to adhere to certain well-defined parts, these being A, a manner that, quote, promotes the Constitution's purposes, values, and principles, end of quote, B, a manner that, quote, advances the rule of law, the human rights, and fundamental freedoms in the Bill of Rights, end of quote. C, a manner that, quote, contributes to good governance, end of quote. The foregoing prescriptions in the context of the exercise of the people's electoral rights as took place on the 8th of August, 2017, are the firm foundation upon which I have founded my dissent from the majority opinion in this critical election petition. <laughs>